No Mernstack project is complete without reviewing and refactoring both front-end and back-end code where needed. Hello and welcome. I'm Dave. Today we will review and refactor our Mernstack project code. I'll provide links to example source code and all resources in the description below. Today's lesson will have two code repositories, one for the front end and one for the back end of our Mernstack project. Our starter code for the back end is the completed source code from lesson eight, which is the last time we worked on the back end REST API. I've got the package JSON open for our back end code now, and I'm just going to change lesson eight to lesson 12, and then I'm going to put a dash and put BE for back end, because we're also going to have a repository for the front end. When creating projects, I don't get a traditional code review like I would working on a team. But the nice thing is, is I release lesson by lesson and build a playlist on YouTube or wherever you've watched the video, I get feedback and questions and I'm able to answer those questions, give responses, look up details, and sometimes viewers catch things that I may have overlooked or they think about things in a different way. That's actually one of the things I love about teaching is because I learn as I teach as well. My students at university or just viewers on YouTube help me see things in a different way. So I've had some, some questions as I've built this playlist for our Mernstack project, and they've identified some things. And a code review and building in public can, of course, make you go, I am not perfect, and I know I'm not perfect, and there are some things we need to correct today. So thank you in advance. Well, I say in advance, thank you for previously reviewing those things, and thank you in advance for anything you help me with in the future. I do sincerely appreciate it. Now, what we're going to look at first are the controllers, and that's when I really started to get some comments when we were building the logic for the controllers, specifically the notes controller and the users controller. So let's look at this note controller first and what we'll look for is the duplicates area so we can do control F and we can just search for duplicates for when I was searching for duplicates and well, I guess not with an S but just duplicate and there we can find it in the file you could also just go to the controller directory here and then right click and choose find in folder and then you could just search duplicate and it will find everywhere we looked for a duplicate in these controllers and then we could bring that up and that's a good way to do that. Now the first thing I actually want to do is go to the model because I was asked instead of looking for a duplicate title for example or in the user we were doing usernames why not just set that to unique. Well unique does help but it creates an index and that will provide a duplicate key error when we attempt to save a record that would need to catch a duplicate but we're not sending you know that user friendly error like we have in the controllers when I look back here let's find the user area here and we're sending specific messages and status numbers for these error messages and so we were getting some granular control some specific control over that and we would have to do that in a different way if we based that say on setting that unique or some of the other things we might do where we would only catch the error when we attempted to save the new user for example and we find that here as we go oh here's created this was actually user.create but other places where we update I believe we save as I scroll down here and look yep await user.save in the update that we see here so we would be catching the errors there in a try catch block if you remember in the controllers we used an a sync handler and so that catches those errors instead of using a try catch for the await and if we're not expecting the errors the ones that we did not already anticipate that we're grabbing and sending the specific errors that we defined and of course those user friendly messages then they get kicked out to our error handler middleware that we created in the middleware directory here and then it sends whatever the error is that's generated not always quite as user friendly so that's why I took this approach I wanted to handle all of the errors that we could that we expected that we knew we might get and send the specific error messages and status uh, HTTP status numbers like 400 here for example or we'd have a 409 for conflict I believe when we have a duplicate yep there we have that and I wanted to send those specifically and have control over that so that answers some of that like why we didn't specifically use unique but another reason is unique doesn't necessarily 
check for case sensitivity. And that's the second thing I need to bring up that I got called out on and it's correct. I'm busted on that one. I should have checked for case insensitivity and I didn't. So in other words, if we put in a name like capital D at the beginning of Dave for a username, and then we put in Dave all lowercase, they would be different. Unique wouldn't catch that, and we would allow two Daves to have that username. So we want to make that search case insensitive, in other words, instead of case sensitive. Now I'm currently in the user's controller. I can highlight that here in the file tree. So let's make the change here first. That will adjust our search and make it case insensitive. And I've received several suggestions on how to do this also, as far as just setting everything to lower case or requiring that on the input. But then of course our users would have to say they just want lower case. And we wanted to go ahead and allow uppercase letters, or I wanted to for this project. So I didn't do that. A regex was also suggested and you could set the case insensitivity on the regex. That would be another good solution. However, there is a solution that is documented for MongoDB and the mongoose JS documentation links directly to MongoDB for that, and it will easily adjust this for us. So all we need to do is find our initial search for that duplicate. So let's go ahead and search for duplicate in this file once again. And we can see we found five of nine, so it's in at least a couple of places. Here's the first area right here. So let's see what we're in. We're in the create new user handler here inside of our users controller. And we're just going to change our find one that we have looking for this duplicate. Right now it says await user.find1. We pass in the username. We have lean because we don't need to get the entire object back. We're just checking that username. Then we execute that. But what we can do is use a collation. And then you just have to add what strength you are providing for the search. And we can chain it right in here. I'm going to press Alt Z so this wraps. So now you can see we have the find one and the username. And then I've added this collation, and I will link to the documentation in the description for this. But you must provide the locale property here. And after that, you can set a strength. And we'll just go ahead and set that to two. And there's several things that that does. One of the things that it does is it checks for that case insensitivity. So simply by chaining this to our find one request, and then of course having lean and exec after, this will fix our problem and it will check all capital letters or all lowercase letters, it doesn't matter, two Daves will still be identified and only one person will be able to have the username Dave no matter the capitalization or the lowercase. So let's go ahead and find the other instance that we're looking for a duplicate in this file and let's apply the same there. And here we are on line 72 now. Let's see what we're in. This is in the update user. Once again, we're looking for a duplicate here. So we want to put that right after the find one. I'll just paste that collation in and that will work. Okay, now let's go to the notes controller and make this same adjustment for where we look for duplicates there. And let's make sure we're on the first instance of duplicate. There we are. So we have note, find one, and we can put the collation. It's the identical code. There's nothing that changes here that's different than where we put it in the user controller. It's just a collation with the locale property. I'm setting it to EN for English, and you could set yours differently if you want to. And then we have strength, and it's set to two. And after we find that one, let's go ahead and find the next time we use duplicate. And it's here probably inside of the update note, just like we had update user. And we'll put that here as well and save. Okay, another review comment that I had was we have a default in the user model and that default has employee set here and we have a string for the array. Now it said the comment I received and they're correct that if we provide this default, we don't really need to require a default role to be sent or the role's value to be sent at all when we create a user. And I remember going through that tutorial and I said, I'm going to require the roles anyway. It doesn't hurt a thing, but we can fix that so the default is available. However, I believe in our front end code, we've already required the roles, so it's not a big deal, but I did just want to show how to do that. And I also wanted to fix something here in the schema as I went over that 
And this is worth noting because we actually uh, put this in differently than it should be, and I just didn't catch it before. So this is good to note right here. What we want to have, instead of having the array here around everything, we'll put roles, have an object, then we'll say type string, and we'll just put the word string inside of this array right here. After that, we'll have a default, and we'll also put the default value inside that array like you see there. Okay, now that we've made this change to our user schema, and I'm going to save this file, let's go back to the user's controller, and let's find the create new user method once again. I'm scrolling up, here we are on line 24 in the user's controller for create new user. So we can just make a couple of changes here that will not require the roles, but we'll still use them if they are received, like we are getting here from the request body. So here's where we were requiring those and saying all fields are required. Well, we can change this then if we're not going to require the roles to be received and just remove this last part of the conditional. So now we're just checking to make sure we've received a username and a password. After that, let's just scroll down to where we create our user object. And now there just needs to be a little bit of conditional logic right here instead of always sending the username, pass the hashed password and the roles as we create a user. So I'm going to change this and we're going to use a ternary statement and I'll just put this in and save so you can see the better formatting. And here we're creating the user object and we're providing a conditional here, basically the same conditionals that we took out up above. And now we're saying if these are true, if one or the other, then we're going to do this, where we just send the username and the hashed password. So this means if we do not have an array of roles, or if we have an array, but it doesn't have any length, essentially nothing's in it, then we're just going to use the username and hashed password. Otherwise, we're going to do what we were doing before, send the username, the hashed password, and the roles as we create the user. So that easily makes the change for the comment I received on that. And of course, like I said, you don't have to because in our front end code, we were definitely requiring the roles, but this just makes it a little more thorough and shows, yes, that can be done. I did also receive a couple of comments about why I was choosing for for instance, save instead of using, say, find one and update or find one and delete, where I was just using, say, find by ID or find one, and then later on actually saving the changes as we see here in the update user. And I've got a couple of reasons to explain that. One is, again, I wanted that granular control or more control, you could say, to give those specific error messages where it as if I was using the find one and update, essentially we'd be trying to do everything at first. I wouldn't be checking any of this beforehand, and then I would be handling errors afterwards. And that brings me to my second reason. Then I would have to use a try catch block instead of using the async handler that we had before that would kick those errors out to our error handler middleware immediately. Using the try catch, we would have to handle those errors afterwards and of course we could give different reasons inside of the catch and then we'd have to pass the error to next. So it could be done, it's just a different way of doing it. Also, I guess a third reason here is when I teach things, I tend to do one step after the other, not so declarative. And sometimes when I'm just coding for myself, I may be a little bit more declarative, but it's easier for me to walk students through steps one by one. So that is a, another good reason that I didn't just try to do everything at once. So we walked through each step here, everything that I would look for in a controller, each error message that I would send back, and eventually we save our changes and of course send a successful message. And just one final note for our backend code, and this will impact the controllers, and it's our use of async handler. We're bringing this into each controller, we're wrapping our methods that have async await. And of course, if there is an unexpected message, because this async handler lets us avoid using try catch blocks, but if there is an error that we didn't expect, of course, like here's the 400 we are expecting that says no users found, but if there's something we didn't expect and it gets kicked out, then it goes to our error handler. But there is another package I have discovered that is actually 
easier to implement than this async handler. It doesn't require us to wrap every method, but it is easily applied by just requiring the package in your server JS. So you don't have to make this change. Our async handler is doing the exact same thing. I would just recommend it for the future because it's easier to use. If you do want to implement it, we will need to remove the async handler and anytime we wrapped it around a method inside of our code. So I won't walk through doing each one of those, but I will show you how to install the new package and what the name of that package is. So let's go to the package JSON. I'll scroll up here so we can see our dependencies. And then I'm going to control backtick and then I'm going to say npm i, and then it is express, I could spell express, dash async, dash errors instead of handler. I'm going to go ahead and install this, and then all we need to do is require it at the top of our server JS. So I'm going to close the terminal so we can see just a little bit better, and I wanna put it before the port, but after that it's fine. So we could just require it right here, and as long as it's required, and I guess because we're doing the same with .env instead of having it right here, I'll just put it at the top underneath the .env require. And then it just applies itself everywhere in your application. So you do not need to do what we did with the async handler that you see being imported into each one of the controllers and then wrapped around each method. So I'm going to remove those you, and then I'll come back to the code. You can do the same if you want to, or for this project, if you want, you can just leave your async handler in there. I'm also going to uninstall the express async handler. And I guess I could do that now to show you in the package JSON as well. So that would be npm uninstall, and then you just name the package. So express async handler. Again, only make this change if you want to. Okay, I have removed all the instances of Express Async Handler from my controllers. I'll just show you one for example. No import at the top of the auth controller now. Previously, the login method had the async handler wrapped around it, and I have removed that as well. And I've done that for all of the different methods in each of the controllers that were using the async handler. So no import and no wrapping the async handler around any method if you're using the package express async errors now. And again, the only thing you need to do to use express async errors is it required at the top of your server JS. So yes, a nice change to a different dependency if you want to make that change. One more change to our backend code and then we'll be finished and able to move on to the front end repository. But this change is going to be inside of our middleware and in our error handler. And this is something we need to do because of how we're handling errors in Redux and RTK query. Right now, if an error gets kicked to our error handler, it sends the message and that's pretty much it. So we don't know what the status is going to be. It's kind of a mystery status and we figure it out along the way. And if we don't know it, we set it to 500, which is a server error. But what we do need to do is one extra flag that RTK query is going to look for and that is to be is error is true. Now the other errors that might be encountered, RTK query will already know their errors, but we want these messages from our error handler to specifically be flagged as errors, and we'll be able to handle this as we validate the status back in our API slices in the front end code. So this is just something we would need to communicate to the back end developers if you were working on a team that, hey, uh, we're using Redux with RTK query, and any unexpected error, it would be nice if you could set is error to true for us. So I'll go ahead and save that. And with that final change, we're finished with the changes to the back end code. So now let's move on to the front end repository. Now we're at the starter code for our front end repository. And the last time we worked on the front end was just in the previous lesson, lesson 11. Let's just go ahead and change this to lesson 12 in the package JSON and save our file. Now from there, the first thing we need to discuss is what is in the notes and the user's API slice. Unfortunately, we have a few more changes to make to the front end, so we better get started quickly and we'll go to the features directory and let's go to the notes and now we can scroll down to the notes API slice. Now something that I overlooked that a viewer 
kindly pointed out to me was the validate status I put in here, I put it outside of the query and it hasn't heard anything. Our app has been functioning. However, it's actually a property that belongs to the query. Right now, I'm just giving the query the notes endpoint here, the address to attach to the base URL. We need to change this and apply the validate status and then we'll identify notes here with a URL key. So let's go ahead and highlight this full query right here under get notes. You can see when I paste this in now, it's going to look just a little different. Now we have a parentheses and an object and here we say this is the URL and there's notes and now we have our validate status here. Now coming just from the back end code where we made that other change, if we have an unexpected error, we're not sure what the response is going to be, then it goes through this validate status process. And notice we say if we do not have result dot is error. And that's specifically why we were setting that is error to true in the error handler middleware in the back end so it would catch right here, which will allow us to display the error message that we get. Something else worth noting while we're in here is that if you've got an error about response dot data and map not being a function, well, that means you do not have an array at this point. That response data has to be an array to map over it. So you could check to see if you have an array here and do an early return. I'm not going to put that in because I'm going to say, look, you need to know what errors you're receiving. And of course, this validate status helps with an error that you might not expect as well. So if it's not coming from your error handler or it's an unexpected error, well, then you just need to have control of that data and you should always be receiving an array here. So you could put in a check for an array, but you're going to have other problems right afterwards with the provides tags as well, for example. And you really just need to have an array at this point. So make sure that back end is sending the expected response. And if it's not the expected response, it should be an error. Okay, let's save these changes to the notes API slice and let's do the same to the users API slice because I made that same validate status mistake right here where I had it outside of the query. So I'm going to go ahead and adjust that and now we have our users URL and the validate status is part of the query object. Okay, now I'm going to close these files, but we're going to go up and look at our prefetch component that is inside of the auth directory. Now this has definitely been working for us. I'll press control B so we can see it a little easier here. And what it's been doing is initiating the state for Redux. And so it's made sure that these queries have all of their data ahead of time. And of course we can even refresh the page and it grabs that data again quickly, but it is using the initiate. We need to break away from the actual Redux that we're used to using because then when I pull in this data later, say in the note component or in the edit note component, for example, we're using the use selector and then we're passing in a selector. But what we really need to do is use the RTK query, use get notes query that also runs. And then of course we can select results from that. We don't have to request that data again. And we can use this prefetch component to instead of putting that initial state with initiate into Redux, we can use it to actually prefetch and it makes it just a little bit easier actually. So let's go ahead and do that. I'm going to remove the console logs as well. And I'm just going to paste in what we do and I'll save this so it comes over, but what we do to actually use a prefetch that is built in and we can prefetch those hooks that we are using. So we have the notes API slice dot util dot prefetch. And then we identify the endpoint and we have a get notes endpoint and a get users endpoint. Now let's go ahead and pass in an argument to name these just like we did in the hooks query notes list and users list. And of course, then they will be the same subscriptions. And that subscription is what a component does. It says, Hey, I'm using this data to Redux. And so it is subscribed while the component is mounted. After it unmounts, it holds the data by default for 60 seconds, but we've shortened that up in our slice by saying keep unused data for only five seconds. I'm also passing this force true here. So that means anytime it comes to the prefetch, even if it has that previous data, it's going to query it. So that just forces that query, even if the data already exists in there. We can also just remove this return. 
there's nothing to unsubscribe from here. This is just a prefetch. So I'll remove that return so we don't have to clean up. That is the cleanup function of use effect. And we can pretty much get rid of the empty spaces if we want to as well. I guess I could bring use effect down one so it's a little easier to see from the prefetch. But there we have changed our component. Now this is going to break a few things right now, so we'll need to change those as well. And we'll see those in those children components from our list. Right now, we'll just be prefetching those hooks that we have in the users list and the notes list. I'm going to show the file tree again, and let's go to the package JSON because as we go through some of these child components like the edit note and the edit user, I want to add a spinner as well. So let's just go ahead and add that dependency, and as we're editing those different components, we can add the spinner in also. So control back tick to open up the terminal and npm i and then react dash spinners. And this is a nice package that provides some predefined, some already created essentially spinners that we can apply inside of our project. And so now we see React Spinners has been added as a dependency. Now let's go to our note component. And what we need to do is actually use the data we already get from our notes list query right here. We have use get notes query inside of our notes list. But then when we pass it to note, what we've currently been doing is using the use selector and passing in a selector. Well, we're changing this approach now. So we won't have the use selector or select note by ID. So let's go ahead and remove those. And then in its place, let's go ahead and import our use get notes query that we're using inside of our list as well. But we're not going to have to query all that data again because what we can do to define note instead of this use selector, and I'll delete that and just paste in the difference and we'll look at how this works. We can define our note from the use get notes query that we have in the notes list and we're naming it the same but then it has this function called select from result. So we already know we have a result and we're getting the data from that. Now remember we have our data broken into an IDs array and then entities. And what we want is the specific note. So we're passing in the note ID and then here we're just defining the note when we select from result. This is a selector essentially for our use get notes query data. And here we have data.entities and then we're providing the note ID. And that gives us the note in the same way. There's no other changes to be made here. We're just getting that data in a different way. So we'll save this, and now we should still be able to have all of these notes, and we're only making the one query with use get notes query. This will not create a separate query or network request, I should say. It will get this note from the data that is already queried. And while we're in the note component, there's one other optimization we can make. So let's go ahead and add it as well. We'll say import, and this is going to be memo, and it comes from React. You may have heard this referred to as react.memo, where we would just import React and then use dot notation to use memo. But we can just destructure memo this way as well. Now at the bottom of this component then, we need to go ahead and put that in place, and I'm going to say const memoized note, and then set that equal to memo, and then pass in the note we have created. We'll create some space here as well. And then instead of default here for the export default note, we will go ahead and export the memoized note. Now this component will only re-render if there are changes in the data. Now let's do the same to our user component. So we are no longer using the use selector or select user by ID. And instead, I will import use get users query. And then from that, we can get rid of where we're currently defining the user with the use selector. And instead, I'll paste in once again our use get users query we select from result and we get the data and then we get the user that we need. After that, we can also import memo here. And let's get that from React there in our list. There we go. And then we can scroll to the bottom and I'll create an extra line here and I'm going to define const memoized user, set this equal to memo, pass in the user, and then our default export will be the memoized user here. 
And I should add, if you're not familiar with how React Memo works, I do have a separate tutorial on that that I'll link to in the description as well. Now let's move on to our edit user component, and we have a few changes we can make here. At the top, I've got the imports we need, so I'll put in the use get users query once again, and then I'm also going to import a pulse loader from that React spinners package that we added as a dependency, and you can see it has react-spinners slash pulse loader, which is one of the choices, and I'll put a link to that full package in the description. Also, you might want to make a different choice than the pulse loader. That's what I'm going to use. I'll get rid of that space, and we can once again define our user inside of this component, and it's going to be just a little bit different because notice we have an ID now that we're passing instead of an ID that comes in here. We're getting it from the params, which would be in the URL. And so then we can use that select from result and we pass the ID here instead of being destructured as a prop, it comes from the use params. And either way, we still end up with the user. And now I'll scroll up just a little bit and I'm going to change some of this logic that we have here. No longer going to use the ternary. I'm going to say if we do not have a user, we're just going to return that pulse loader. That means it is probably still loading. If not, we're going to of course create the content and then return that content. Now let's move on to the new note component in the notes directory, and we'll once again import what we need at the top. This is the use get users query. Notice that even though we're in the new note, we're pulling in the users because we need those users when we create a note to assign the note to a user. And once again, we're going to replace the use selector and the select all users selector and we'll put in our select from result using the use get users query here. Now that means we do not need these imports. I should go back and check that, of course, in the last component we were in, I may have forgotten to remove the old imports. But after we define the users, I'm going to change one other line here, and that's because we're going to use that pulse loader again. So instead of saying not currently available, we'll put the loader here if the users do not have length, and then we of course have the content equal to the new note form and return the content. Let's quickly go back and see if I have some old imports at the top and I do, we don't need the use selector or select user ID here inside of the edit user component. How about the user component? It's fine and the note component looks like it's fine too, so we're good there. And now let's move to the edit note component. Now I had a separate question on this component that I received, and it said, hey, we could use one more layer of security other than what I put in in the last lesson, which was about uh, role-based access control and permissions, and this would be what if an employee tried to edit a note that isn't available to them through a role just by changing the note ID and the URL. Now you'd like to think your employees aren't malicious and that it might even be hard for them to get whatever note ID would exist that they would want. However, we can go ahead and programmatically correct that or look for that. So let's go ahead and do that while we're here. So I'm going to add a few imports at the top. We'll notice we've got four imports here. We've got the use get notes query and the use get users query. We're also going to bring in our use auth hook and then that pulse loader that we're going to use. And we can get rid of the selector, select note by ID and select all users. And we can also get rid of use selector. So let's delete all of those. And now let's go ahead and put this code into place. I'll just start by replacing how we're defining the note and users here and paste in a destructure from our use auth hook and then also how we define the note. And I'll save that, but we still need to handle the users. So now I'll put that underneath and let's look at the information that we're getting here. We'll quickly break it down in case anything is different. So we're bringing in the username, is manager, and is admin. Of course, we're using that use auth hook to make sure for that situation that I described where an employee could still possibly enter a note ID in the URL and get access even though their role didn't permit them. So we're going to prevent that from happening. Here we're getting the note and we're getting that ID from use params once again to define the note. 
Now, when we get the users list, we're doing this a little bit differently, and we should have done that in the last component too for new notes, and that is we're mapping over that data, the IDs array that we get back. That is iterable, the entities are not, so we need to map over the IDs array. For each ID, we're grabbing the entity, which is the user, and putting it in a new array, and so users ends up being a users array for us here. And if we look back at new note, that is the same thing we did here, which I didn't review quite as thoroughly, but it's the identical thing. We end up with a user's array. So we can save those changes. And now we're going to change this content line here. So I'll highlight this and put in a few changes. Again, this is somewhat to prevent that uh, possibility of an employee entering in a note ID into the URL and still gaining access to it even though their role didn't permit them. But the first thing we're doing is making sure we have a note and that we have a user's array with some values in it and we're returning the pulse loader if we don't. So we may briefly see that while we're waiting on this data. After that we're checking to see if we do not have a manager or we do not have an admin. And if we don't have either one of these, we're just going to pass along this second conditional here, which we could chain, but then we'd have to put this twice, like uh, is manager and this, and then is admin and this. And by nesting this, we just have to do this once. So we're checking to see if we have an admin or manager. And if we don't, then we're checking to see if the notes username matches the current username that we get from use auth. Now, if they don't match, then we return no access. So that solves our problem. Other than that, we define the content and return the content here. Okay, so we've made some big changes into how we get the data. Now we're not pre-populating Redux, and that is going to let our queries use the data that we get from the use get users query and use get notes query in the lists to be reused in the child components. And that works out just a little bit better. It's also going to allow us to see updates from other users. And that's very important. I'm back in the backend code now in a separate instance of VS code. I'm going to start the backend rest API first with npm run dev. Once we confirm it's running, then I'll go back to the front end code and I'm going to once again open up a terminal window and there I'll type npm start to start the React app and we should see it open in our Chrome browser. Okay, our app is up and running. I'm going to open up Chrome DevTools and I've got the network tab open. So let's log in as our stakeholder dandy and this network tab is going to let us see the requests that are going out. So we're at the welcome page and now we have a request to the auth endpoint, to the notes endpoint, and to the user's endpoint. So we have prefetched that data. Now, if we go to view the tech notes, another request went from our query to notes, and that's okay. So we have that data. Now let's go ahead and look at an individual note. And notice, no extra query went out. We're using the data that we already got from our use get notes query. So that is what we wanted to happen. And now I had an access token timeout, and so it hit the refresh endpoint, and we've got another notes query here. But that is due to how the timing is set currently in our backend code, which, of course, before we deploy, we want to make sure we're at 15 minutes and seven days. 15 minutes on the access token, seven days on that. So I'll want to change that. I think from lesson eight, we had it shorter. Okay, now let's go to the users. And we can see we have a user's request here. By the way, notes is still has a polling interval of every 15 seconds it's going to request notes again. But we've got the users. And now if I go to an individual user, like our test user, it didn't put in another request to users either. So that is also working as we wanted it to. So that's great. Now let's go back to our user. Notice I've got a user here named Dave that's an employee. Let's try to create a new employee and we'll just name him Dave all uppercase and I'll just put in a simple password and let's see if we can save. 
And note, now we get duplicate username, and that's because the collation we put in our backend code is checking for that case insensitivity. So even a lowercase Dave will match an all uppercase Dave. So that's also what we want. I'm going to quickly bring up the backend code once again. Let's go to that auth controller, and I'll check the timing that we've currently got set here from lesson eight. Yep, 15 seconds on the access controller. We want something a little longer than that, so I'm going to go to 15 minutes and I'll probably need to scroll down to find the second place that is set yes 15 minutes instead of seconds it looks like we were already at seven days for the refresh token those are the numbers we want to use in for this project so now that we've set that that should change things a little bit I'll clear that out we'll log out notice on the log out we had notes because it refocused on the window and we've got a refetch on focus. But after that, we hit that logout endpoint. It deleted our secure cookie with the refresh token when we logged out. Now let's log in again and check out some state in Redux DevTools. So I'll log in with Dandy first. And once we're logged in, I'll open up our DevTools window and now let's go to Redux. And I'll pull this over so we can see the state a little bit better on the right. And let's look at this API state. And we currently have our queries that are identified as notes list and users list. And then we also have subscriptions. And we can see the subscriptions here as notes list and users list. And of course, it lists the endpoints beside those as well. Now, if we break this down, we have two subscriptions here, it looks like, and two here under Get Users. See what happens when we go to Tech Notes, and it adds some more. So now this is one for each of these notes that it created, and that's okay too, because we're using the Use Get Notes query there, but we're not creating another network request as we saw before when we look here. We've just got notes, and then once again, notes there. And we could log out and see all of that happen one more time. So we'll go dandy, log in. And so now we went auth, notes, users. We go to notes, we'll see another notes request. But now we look at one of these, and we don't see another notes request there. So requests, network requests, are not the same as Redux subscriptions, and that's important to point out. But subscriptions last as long as a component is mounted. And remember, each one of these notes in the list is a note component that is mounted as well. So now instead of looking at our state here, let's go ahead and look at the profiler too. Now we can record some data as we profile. So let's go ahead and make a change to Mrs. Smith's computer problem. Although it says it's completed, we can go ahead and just maybe add another exclamation mark here to the end and save, but I didn't profile anything, so I should have hit record. So I'll hit record here and let's do this again and I'll just remove that extra exclamation mark and save. Now let's stop the profiler and let's see what we get. This is showing everything and notice we've got one of nine screens to look at. So I'll scroll all the way down. Here's our notes list. And when it rendered, because we memoized those notes, the notes did not render. So that makes it a little more optimized. Now let's go to the next changes. And of course, if we pull this over, I think, maybe I need to pull this over further, DevTools at least, it can see what caused this update. And that says browser router. So it'll give us some information as we go. Edit note, so we were at the edit note form. And every time we typed, of course, we got a render there and anything else we did. And so it has a few renders. Now we've got what caused this update. It was browser router when we went back. But now let's look at the final one. And the only render we got was the one we updated. So it knew that the other two notes were not updated. And we got that final update right here. So our React memo is working as we expected as well. Okay, now that we've checked our optimizations, I'm going to make this full screen and I'll go ahead and log out. And we want to go back to the code. There's just a few other changes we could make. So here is our React code and we can leave it running as far as that goes. I'll just close the terminal window. And one thing I'm going to do, I'll collapse these directories over here in the file tree, but I'm going to highlight this source directory and we could find in all the folders anywhere we have a paragraph that starts with loading and then dot, dot, dot. And that's usually what I would want to replace 
with that spinner we included. And so I will go through and do all of these, but just to let you know, you could search for that as well. Or you could also search for that if is loading that seems to appear at all of those. So check if is loading and then look for all of those in files and you may want to replace what you have there with one of those spinners instead. Again, I'm not going to show you that I change every one. You can just do it and you can trust that I did it as well. Okay, one final change today. I'm going to bring the browser back up. Notice at the top, because a React app is truly a single page app that we make look like it has multiple pages by using React Router, but notice the title is always React App, and that's what's set in our basic HTML page that's in the public directory. However, we can create a hook that changes this for each React router page we visit. So let's go ahead and do that. That's one nice little addition to add at the end of our project. I'll go back to the file tree, and now we'll go to the hooks directory. We're going to create one more custom hook, and we'll call this useTitle.js. Now inside of use title JS, I'll just paste what I have and go over it. We need use effect from React, and then we're going to receive a title, whatever we want the title of the component to be that is currently displaying a page. And then we'll use use effect here. We'll get the previous title by selecting document.title, that's from the DOM, and then we're setting the document.title to the new title value. We're storing the old one in previous title. Our cleanup function restores the previous title to the document title. So whenever the component unmounts, it sets the title back to whatever it originally was. And we're just looking for changes in the title. Now this is a true side effect. It doesn't have anything else it's returning from this hook. And it's really, in my mind, kind of the perfect React hook. It does a simple thing, and it sets things back to the way they were with the cleanup function when it is finished. So a nice little hook there that we call use title, and let's just apply it in the app.js, and you can apply it throughout the rest of the project where you want to, and you can trust that I will do the same as well. So we're going to import use title, and now that we have use title, this would be our main page, and so we just want to put the, the name of Dan's business, which is Dan D Repairs. So we can just say use title, and we'll pass in Dan D Repairs. And that's really all you need to do to set the title of the page you're on. So we would have other ones like notes list, the uh, users list, things like that. You might want to start all of those with tech notes or something that indicates you're in the back end where employees log in, those protected pages. And you can do what you want. And of course, you can check the source code that I'm going to link to in the course resources for mine. But right now, let's pull up Chrome once again. And now you can see we've changed from React App at the top to Dandy Repairs. And so our use title hook is working. Okay, I thought I might get the chance to deploy everything today, but we're going to carry it over to one more lesson where we're going to deploy the back end code and then deploy the front end code and take everything online and make sure it's working. And of course, there's a few changes you need to make as you deploy your project as well. Remember to keep striving for progress over perfection and a little progress every day will go a very long way. Please give this video a like if it's helped you. And thank you for watching and subscribing. You're helping my channel grow. Have a great day, and let's write more code together very soon.